Hello, listeners. Hello, classroom. This is Dr. Annette Ferovich. I am here this afternoon with leftover classes from yesterday, but we are still on day 137. And guess what I did? I got our chalkboard up to date. Got our chalkboard up to date with our spring flowers. And I remembered I couldn't do this every single time because I could barely keep this chalkboard up with just changing the number, as you all know. But for today, we're going to have a DIY psychologist. And remember, our very broad theme is evolution and psychology, right? That's our very broad theme. Okay, so let's keep a move on. I know, I keep getting data downloads over here. And, uh, oh, I couldn't remember the third time I died. I know, it's kind of a weird thing. I know. But it was, uh, my mom put me in the freezer. Now, my mom was young, and the problem was, was that grandma was watching her, and grandma, people were never home. So the kids got to just basically experiment on the, 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 the orphan kid that nobody liked, and that was me. And so they did. And I now have a memory of being, yeah, put in a freezer and then taken out. And they're like, she's cold, but she's not, whatever. So then they put me in the freezer for two days. And I remember sitting in front of a fireplace and basically thawing. Okay, so, and that would be traumatic, wouldn't it? And we've talked about this. We talked about it already, um, about distance, right? It is really important to put distance between you and the trauma. And you cannot do therapy without it. You cannot do therapy without the distance. Uh, but, yeah, that being said... You can put distance, if you put distance between you and the trauma, again, you can't be, right? If, if you're expecting to be healed, for example, from sexual abuse, and the sexual abuse is still going on, you can't be healed from that, right? It's not time to be healed from that. There's still uh, uh, more lessons to be learned, something, right? Some other unfolding of that process. So, um... You have to be, and, 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 you know, good for you that the greater the distance. So if you've been somebody who's been procrastinating about getting rid of your trauma that you had prior to, what, or, you know, that you had in, you know, your past, if you want to get through that, you first of all have to have some distance. And like I said, lucky you, the greater the distance. So if you've been procrastinating Actually, that much it's going to be much more easier to digest the trauma. All right, it's like you know, and I'm here for your comic relief Tuesdays and Thursdays. No, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, three days on, three days off. So, to help you through this, because the closer you are to the trauma, the more that you are going to be triggered, right? That's what, oh, I forgot we were supposed to talk about triggers, weren't we? But we already know what a trigger is, which is a $500 reaction to a $5 problem, right? So you could probably, you know, I think that's maybe, I've done, I've done talks on triggers. Triggers are so easy for everybody to understand, right? Because uh, we use, it's, it's in our language. You're being triggered. Are you being triggered, Right. Yeah, really interesting. Some of the things that are, you know, coming across my telegraph in my mind. All right, so 
you're going to be triggered much more often the closer you are to that trauma. Unless you really are, you know, able to deal with it online. Like on whenever I say that, online, that means like in real time. That's just my language, right? So in real time, for you to be able to deal with a trauma in real time. And some traumas I don't think you can ever deal with in real time, right? There are some traumas you, you just can't. And those are the traumas that trigger you later on. And those are really are the traumas that we're talking about, right? The traumas that you couldn't deal with in real time. And as those traumas get stacked up, what we find is, is that they can accumulate. And so that we are having the same kind of, and all of us do a defensive reaction, right? It's just how often do we have a defensive reaction? So you could call it that. You could call it what? What's it? Triggers. You could call triggers defensive reactions. And that would be appropriate. That would be right, right? So where are we in the scheme of things? We are still not on 135, but we just always have to refocus because it really just seems hard to believe that whenever we are talking about our DIY psychologist, we really are talking about two lies, right? I am not worthy and you got it, I am stuck. And one way to do this, as I said in the last class at the end, kind of a segue into this class is, is that even though it appears that it is not systematic right now, that is simply because I'm trying to get you to buy into this first. Remember, this is about heart beliefs, right? They're about heart beliefs and that you have, and this is where you get really feelings of truth, right? This is... Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to speak about this in just a little bit different terms, but it just is really interesting how I've learned this. So, the unforgivable sin. If you're talking spiritually about an unforgivable sin, Mike Pence, the unforgivable sin is, is when, you, when the Holy Spirit tells you to say something and you won't say it. And usually that is out of fear, and out of fear because we have a guilty conscience. So we're going to end up exposing our lies, exposing ourselves, and getting ourselves in, in, in a position where I have to uh, admit that I, am, I did something wrong. And then I'm going to get punished, which is going to put me in a predicament, right? So it's going to lead to both of those lies. So... We, we prevent ourselves from speaking up, right? We prevent ourselves from speaking up. So we have to get to the, the tr we have to believe it in our hearts that it's worth speaking up about, right? And that's where the spirit resides. We have to believe that we can turn our hearts over to that spirit. That's a way better way of saying it. We have to believe that we, ha we can turn our hearts over to that spirit. And the only way that we can believe that is if we believe we are good people. I would never turn my spirit over to a... If I believed that spirit was bad, do you see? And who are you turning your spirit over to the voice inside your head, right? Many times I've said that I've been in predicaments where I, where the, what would the, the last thought that would go through my head is, do I say something or not? And then I'm saying it, right? That is Holy Spirit. That is, if, if I were to keep my mouth shut, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it because I have to, exp I'll expose myself and then I'll be stuck. So I can't say it. 
That is the unforgivable sin. And it would be because you don't speak up or out for anything then that's important, not for a child, right? And we all have sins and we all have ways of dealing with those sins. But in the end, if our spirit is one of defense and guilt and closing the mouth, it's understandable that that defense is understandable, but it doesn't, um, it won't jive with your, with your mind, with your body and your spirit, right? So it's like, uh, oh my gosh, she's telling us that because I kept my mouth shut, I am literally engaging in the unforgivable sin and I am. Actually, I am saying that loud and clear. If you're keeping your mouth shut about some important things, then you are engaging in the unforgivable sin. And a lot of uh, televangelists and evangelicals, a lot of them do engage in that, you know, knowing, that, that, or I'm sorry, a lot of them do have the knowledge of what that unforgivable sin truly is. So what do you suppose would be, if they have the knowledge of what the unforgivable sin is, what do you suppose that they would be doing then? Like what would they be shutting up and what would they be saying, right? If they know, they're supposed to be saying, they know what the unforgivable sin is and that comes from a pressure, right? To stand up and do the right thing from our conscience. We used to talk about a conscience. Is that something that those AIs have as a conscience? Can you program a conscience? Right? Can you program that? Not conscience, conscience. And do they know the difference? Does AI even know the difference, right? Do they have to discover that difference? Because I've seen like discovering things that are you know, the son of God or the son of God. I mean, there's a big difference there, isn't there? Right? And, and, and if I were AI, I might not know homophones. <laughs> Did you program homophones? Did you? Do you see how important that is? And even still, and even still, there's just no way that that AI is going to be able to discern on anything close to a human level, no matter how much data they have, right? Truth, and we need the truth from your mouths. We need the truth from your mouths. I don't know, I don't know. So, in order to really get importance and truth from, from our mouths, we really do have to basically create an opportunity for that kind of truth to come forth. It is, uh, <laughs> I did call it refreshing, didn't I? It is because th those uh, peppers on there were really refreshing. It was delicious. Whitefish spread at wherever I went in South Lyon. Mm, I forgot. Anyway, delish, delish. I'm having a flashback on that whitefish spread. Because the word I was going to use was, yeah, fresh, but that wasn't the word I wanted. But then it made me think of the white. See how that works? See how your brain works? She's ADHD. It's evidence right there. Scatterbrain. A skill. William James bringing back the greatest skill, bringing back a wandering mind, right? Okay, so 
the un and I did write it down right there because I because I, that one was going to escape me because it just came to me this unforgivable thin thin this unforgivable sin thing is yeah would have escaped me because it just came to me and so in reliving a trauma do you see the advantage I got to write those I'm going to end up putting that on a slide. Do you see the advantages then in reliving the trauma? It's to get over the fear of what all of that was about, right? It's to get over that fear. So if there was the whole trauma of a situation where you brought an AIDS baby into the world, Right. Let's say that that was the cross that you came to bear. And, and, and the circumstances were not of your own doing, but now what do you do? Right now, what do you do? And certainly you're exposed. Let's say that that is what you did. I just think that, again, I've said it. I do think that the, the, the pharmaceuticals watch killer drugs on Tuesdays here at Healthy Mind, Body, Spirit in the classroom. I just think that uh, the pharmaceuticals are the ones that are killing people. And I just think that our bodies in, in the natural element, not all the time, but more often than not, are able to repair themselves. And I do think that they haven't come past Barbary in uh, surgery. Barbary and surgery. We'll do that on Wednesdays. Because um, they have no reason to, right? They have no reason to. If, if, if I could heal you with a touch, and I've said this before, right? If I can heal you with a touch, that's not going to really cost a lot. You're just going to be a stingy son of a bitch if you don't give it to me free, Right? Exactly. So this is what, and that is something that is worth a lot of money, right? How much money? Well, how much do surgeries cost? How much does the insurance cost? How much do the buildings cost? How much do, does the equipment cost? How much does the technology cost? How much does the R&D cost? Dear Jesus, get the fuck out of here with your health care, you fuckers who are chopping us open like barbarians. So see how the Holy Spirit works in ways that you would never predict? <laughs> Using language that you wouldn't predict, right? So I, I left that slide up there, but I can't read it from here. So we can believe something in our minds, but not our hearts. Um, for me, a lot of times, I don't know. If I believed it about you in my heart, I couldn't keep it in my mind. <laughs> that was sort of a little bit it. It was a little bit. It was if I believed it in my heart that you were a horrible person. I just couldn't keep it in my mind. Right? So when, here's key, when we are reliving these traumas, it is only for a minute. And literally, it is. It's like an, it is kind of sort of an ADHD thing, right? Right? Focus your mind on it. Focus your mind on it. Focus on it. Stop. I can't do that. My mind is like, all of a sudden, okay, uh, bloop. Right? Rightfully so. That's the way that the mind works. So that we can have a distraction even from trauma that we couldn't have had at the moment of the trauma or, or was uh, very difficult to have at the moment of the trauma, unless we really could do something outside of our bodies, right? Oh, that's interesting. I'm trying to think if I did something outside my body. They locked the freezer. They said she kept get, getting out, so they locked the freezer. 
she must have kept getting out. So they locked me in the freezer. And I'm pretty sure that was Aunt Mecha. She was a fucking witch. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. But I can't be 100% sure. I do know she produced two witches and then neither one of them were good, so. <laughs> there you have that. Okay, so. Only for a minute. You don't need the devil to get in there or whatever bad negative spirit gets in there that really came from the trauma. I mean, honestly, think about it. If you could, for example, leave your body during a trauma, let's say that you could, you could in whatever spirit way, you could leave your body during a trauma. Then you've got the spirit world that's being engaged in the physical world, right? So... When you go to revisit that, what's left is just uh, the associations that you're making with the event in your mind. And that is so hard to understand. In fact, it's just coming to me now. So this is something that Ed Smith said on the Transformation Prayer, which I have the link down below for that. And um, this is, and I'm having difficulty because um, cause these thoughts are, are coming online right now. Like in the moment you're seeing me sort of discover what this unfolding of the trauma really contains. If I can leave my body, there's a spiritual battle clearly going on it, even at that moment. And then to access that would be less difficult because there's a, there's a barrier there, right? There, there's, there's something, yeah, there's a cushion there that not all of it is completely tangible. So what you're left with, that's where I was. So what you're left with when you ruminate are only the bad feelings, right? The spirits aren't there as they were in the moment to protect you. So when you relive these without a spiritual protection, and that could be prayer, right? Where It's a safe space for you, right? But to feel safe in a moment of trauma requires something beyond the human condition. So that's what you are calling up. Not, and not the demons of that, the warriors of that, the warriors who were the cushion, not the demons of it. You're recalling the warriors. And that's if you can believe that when you engage in this process. It makes the process a lot easier for you, right? If you could really believe that the spirits you are recalling are spirits that were there, that took the blows, right? There was somebody clearly who took the blows for me. If I was stuffed in a freezer for two days, I told you the seal was broken. I told you I'm getting 